Hi everybody and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. We're going to be continuing in Galatians and we're coming into a portion of this book that has some really wonderful powerful truth in it and man I have just studied and prayed. Okay. Sorry. I didn't I don't know how to tell you that without stopping you. Yeah. Just project it, it, a little. It, yeah. It just I you, you caught my eye and I, I didn't know what it was about. That's okay. I'm very sorry. That's okay. Just I'm sorry. project as much as you can. Right, right. And it's better to be interrupted than not be doing it right. Especially at the beginning. Hi everybody and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. Um, beautiful, beautiful day again today. It's been really warm. Um, and it's gotten even warmer this evening, but um, it's it's just really really pretty day today. Anna, we are going to be continuing in Galatians. We're going to be continuing in the third chapter and finishing the third chapter of Galatians today. This portion of scripture in this letter that Paul had written um, has some really wonderful truth in it, and I have been really studying and really praying that the Lord would help me to know how to convey the wonderful truth that's in this passage. Because to me it's a little bit more difficult to perceive, but it's it's wonderful and it's definitely there. So we're going to begin in Galatians here and just see if we can find out the wonderful things that Paul is really trying to express and share to the people in this church. And yes, I'm still drinking tea. It's very nice. Bill told me I'm going to have to have an iced tea with Jesus someday here. Probably going to be a good idea. <laughs> okay. Now, last week, if I remember correctly, we um, were in the third chapter of Galatians, and we had gone through um, verse 14 and talking about how that um, we don't want to begin our relationship with Christ based on faith and then turn it into a matter of just simply having to follow the law because that is not really what our salvation is based on. So I'm going to start reading now in verse 13 to kind of connect us up now with the rest of the chapter. So we're now this week going to be starting in verse 13 of Galatians 2 and I want to go ahead and go down through verse 29. I've got several other Bibles here that I just want to be able to consult and look at. And now this has been a really neat study for me. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. When men make a covenant, they respect it and they don't add things to it or annul it as if it's not an effect. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises, promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. We're going to stop right there at verse 18 just for right now. Now, if we go back into um, the times of the Old Testament, God called Abraham out and um, became his God for, a, oh, all the way through so much of the Old Testament. and. Uh, they would be referring to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob um, because it was through Abraham that God established himself with a people. And he promised that Abraham's offspring, that his seed, would bless the nations. And it's interesting here that it says, he didn't say seeds, he said 
seed, referring to Christ. Paul makes that very clear here. This was a promise given to Abraham when he was an old man, didn't even have any children, a very old man. He and his wife had no children, but God promised that through his seed, the nations would be blessed. So through Abraham and then through Isaac, his son, through Isaac's son, Jacob, through Jacob's 12 sons and all the way down the line um, until we come to Jesus coming out of this nation of Israel. Um, that was Jacob's other name that God had gave him, given him at one point. But through the, 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 the nation of Israel, that is the people to whom Christ came. So Abraham and the relationship he had with God was built around a promise given by God. Now, when um, the people, uh, when Joseph ended up in Egypt, it's, it's all wonderful stuff. We're gonna, we'll have to do some Old Testament study. But when Joseph, who was of you know the Jewish um, faith, um, he was one of the sons of Jacob. When he ended up in Egypt, um, and the people became established there because he had carefully um, preserved food and because of the famine coming up and the Pharaoh had put him in charge. And um, so the, his family and all of his brothers and all their families ended up in Egypt. So many, many years went by and they ended up enslaved. And um, Moses was the one that God used to lead the people out of Egypt and to lead them into their promised land to become a big nation, a mighty, a mighty nation at that time. And it was Moses that God gave the Ten Commandments to and also that God established a, a lot of the laws that he wanted the people to live by. I think a lot of them were so that they would really truly walk in obedience as far as worshiping him. Many of them were for their own health and their own safety. And um, you know, Moses actually wrote those laws down. Uh, there's very good evidence that the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses. And the oral tradition was very strong there. Um, people lived a long time and so especially up until the time of the flood, you weren't talking to somebody who heard it back 10 generations. You could be talking to someone that was telling the stories that his father had told him. So, you know, Moses uh, wrote this law down for the Jewish people. But Abraham had come first and that, that promise had been given to him. Um, it's, it's wonderful to go through the history and see how God worked through his people through thousands of years. Um, leading up to the time um, when Christ came and God could send his son to a people who believed in him and they could know his salvation and the the truth about God would not have been kind of lost in all of the idolatry and all the worship of idols and and um, the different ways of approaching you know polytheistic gods and all this that had been permeating throughout the world God established a people that would know him as God and so um, they're talking about Abraham here. And we're going to go now in verse 19 in Galatians 3. What purpose then does the law serve? Because God did bring law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed, Jesus, should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, um, you know, Jesus was announced by angels. He was announced by Gabriel. Now, mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. If the law could bring life and could bring righteousness, then it would have done so. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. We were kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. So therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. 
for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. I want to look at that in a couple of other uh, translations here um, and talk about how that, that, you know, why was the law necessary? This is in, uh, I was just reading out of the New King James. This is the New American Standard. Okay. Verse 21 in the New American Standard. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. So therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now that goes down now through verse 26. Now I want to go to a study Bible that I have that's an, a new international version. Um, these are all good um, translations of the scripture. And then I want to share a little bit in here of what the study Bible has to say about these scriptures because I think it expressed it very very well I will make it very clear which is scripture and which is just some notes from the study Bible I'm going to start with 19 and read through verse 26 in here in Galatians 3 what then was the purpose of the law it was added because of transgressions until the seed, Jesus, to whom the promise referred, to whom the promise was referring, that's cool, had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. So that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now that was scripture. Now I'm just going to share a little bit of the notes that are here because I thought it really helped to explain in a really neat way. This is a, um, a New International Version study Bible. Um, I use this a lot when um, Bill and I were both in Bible college. Okay, um, referring to verse 20 the Mosaic Covenant, now that's referring to Moses. The Mosaic Covenant was a formal arrangement of mutual commitments between God and Israel, with Moses as the mediator. He was um, communicating to the people what God's will was for them. But since the promise God covenanted with Abraham involved commitment only from God's side, and God is one, no mediator was involved. Verse 22, 21, the reason the law is not opposed to the promise is that although in itself it cannot save, it serves to reveal sin, which alienates God from man, and to show the need for the salvation that the promise offers. That is, that's wonderful. It showed that we needed the salvation because it showed how far we are from the kind of life that God would want us to live and so far from his holiness. Sin often actually means that we've just simply missed the mark. We're just shooting in the wrong direction totally. So when it says in verse 24 that the law was put in charge, this translates the Greek 
pedagogos, from which pedagogue is derived. Um, you study pedagogy when you're going to study how to teach something to someone. It refers to the personal slave attendant who accompanied a freeborn boy wherever he went and exercised a certain amount of discipline over him. Now, in this case, his function was more like that of a babysitter than a teacher. Sometimes they would be called a guardian. A guardian. So, because we had to see how far we are from what God would know we need to be, we needed the law to show us how badly we've needed the promise. And the promise has come through Christ, through his salvation. He was the seed promised to Abraham through which the whole world would be blessed. I think it's interesting here that we are all called sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's like a sort of an official term, just like women and men are sons of God just like women and men are the bride of Christ. It's, it's a positional statement um, that doesn't really have gender to it, because men and women are sons of God, just like all of us are going to be with Jesus someday and be part of the bride of Christ in a, in a wonderful way. So he's really trying to help us understand that the law was our teacher to show us that we need Christ, that we might be justified by our faith because the promise was to come through faith. And being justified, the best way to understand what that word means is if to just think of it like it's just as if I'd never sinned. The sin is washed away by the blood of Christ. We are truly forgiven. Our our transgressions and sins were nailed on the cross with him and he paid the price and in legal terminology if someone would ever look at that accusation he would say um, it's been completely paid it's completely wiped away so we are justified by our faith in Christ so I'm gonna start at verse 25 now and go down to verse 29 we're just staying in Galatians 3 here but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now that is an interesting statement because the Holy Spirit does dwell within us. But this is saying we're putting on Christ and his righteousness. So it's like we give him our guilt and our sin and our bad attitudes and our anger and our condemnation and our shame all of that was put on him and what he gave us was his righteousness so when God the Father looks at us he sees the blood of Christ he sees that we have the righteousness of his son and we have put on Christ and so it is his holiness now that we have through faith in him. And this is a wonderful passage right here coming up, 28 and 29. Before I say this, um, as a woman, <laughs> I want to really show appreciation to Jesus and to um, God the Father um, because they truly both love and honor women so much. If you look at history, it, you know, I, I believe the devil's real. I know he's real. And he, he, he hates all of God's children. But he just seems to be malicious toward women. That's the best way I can describe it. I, I think God loves us with a great tenderness. And we are also in his image, just like a man is. We're all reflecting different parts of God and who he is. But if you look throughout cultures, all throughout the world, so often the women have been at best second-class citizens or at worst treated as slaves or um, treated very, very badly. Um, sometimes baby girls put to death because it was not as good to have a daughter as it would be to have a son. 
and I'm, and I I'm not going against sons and 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 men. I I'm glad God made both. I love men very much, but um, there's just so many cultures where women are just under the feet of men. If you if you just look honestly throughout history, but Jesus didn't treat women that way. He treated them with gentleness and honor. And let's look at here what um, Paul is saying now in verses 28 and 29 in terms of that as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Then he goes on to say, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed, with a small s this time, multiple seed, and heirs according to the promise. That we are the recipients of that promise. We are the inheritors of it. And that place of honor, that salvation, being welcomed into God's household, being considered as his sons and daughters, being a part of the bride of Christ, all of those things don't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. And remember, if you weren't Jewish, according to the way they looked at it here, you know, he said Jew or Greek, but basically he's saying no matter what nationality you are, whether you're a slave or free, you're not a slave to the Lord. You are an honored child of God. There's neither male nor female. He equally honors men and women. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And um, I appreciate that about him. I appreciate that the Lord is mighty and powerful, but also gracious and a gentleman. And there is a wonderful, I don't want to say wildness, but his power is so great and his creativity is so intense that He's exciting and adventurous, but he's also safe. And like I said, he's also a gentleman. And I appreciate knowing that as women, we are treated with honor by him. And I'm, I'm so thankful to that for that. And of course, men are also treated with great honor. And he understands and knows us very well. So I just pray that as we've looked at the scripture, you'll come to understand a little better that the promise came first um, and that the law was important for us to show how we should live, how things should be. But we cannot um, attain salvation. We cannot please God by the law. Yes, our obedience pleases him, but he wants that to come out of love and out of a, and a, a relationship with him. It all boils down to faith. And our ability to live the way he wants us to live comes from the power of God through the Holy Spirit in our life as he transforms us and helps us to be more like Jesus. So, I think that's really good stuff. And um, I really encourage you to read through in Galatians and really meditate on that scripture. You know, go back and and look at, at what God promised Abraham and, and um, what an amazing thing that was that God established himself as God the creator to a nation of people so that we could know him and then he protected the truth in his word through all these thousands of years so that we would not have to believe lies but we could know him for who he is let's pray Lord, I ask so strongly today that you take away any of my ideas that maybe I don't really understand like I should. God, can your truth and the revelation of your word come through and help us to know you more and to understand what we have never understood before. So Lord, I just pray that for people that are in bondage, that are in bondage to condemnation, that are in bondage to rules, that they could come to know the joyous freedom there is in your presence in their life. And Lord, help us to see that that presence doesn't give us license to do anything we want. It gives us the freedom to 
be free to do what is right and to please you and to know the joy of being in your presence and being in your will. So Lord, I just ask that you touch lives. Lord, I'm thinking about people that have shared with me prayer requests in the comments. Be with a very sick son. Be with a family, Lord, that's going through a really, really scary rough time right now. Be with people that are not feeling well. Their livelihood is, is really struggling. God, you know who they are, and I ask that you really work powerfully in their lives. And so, Lord, I ask it all in Jesus' name, and I love you. Amen. When I pray, I think I get quieter. I hope you guys can hear me. Bill keeps trying to make sure I speak up, and he's right. So I just pray that you could hear my prayer. I'm praying, and so I think my voice just gets kind of quieter, but... I just want with all of my heart for God to be able to speak clearly. So, love you guys, and I will be looking forward to seeing you next time. And know that God has chosen to love you from the foundation of the world. And don't let anybody tell you any different. Bye. I'll see you later. Love you guys.